Hello everyone. I'm just going to wait for a few people to join. And um, yeah, just think that I'm waving back at you, whoever's waving at me. I know all of you have so many things to do every evening and it's a Friday evening. Uh, so many webinars and Zoom sessions and WhatsApp and other Instagram sessions. And I just want to thank you all for uh, taking the time to join me for a brief while. I don't know if uh, some of you have actually uh, started watching Andar's Garden, which is a digital series I'm doing across the Nartaki and my personal social media platforms on Facebook and Instagram. And um, I've been, I decided to do it because I wanted to find a way during this season, this month of Margari, uh, December 15th to January 15th, to share with all of you using social media about this amazing and brilliant poet. And I think that's the way we need to look at Andal. Now, I'm not presuming that all of you who have joined me today would know about her. And why I think that she needs um, a closer look and she must be known outside Tamar country. For too long, I think the Tamar people, and I'm equally to blame, the Bharatanatyam dancers, the Carnatic music community, the temple ritual uh, fraternity, because it's very patriarchal in temples, have sort of held Andar very close and um, assumed that, uh, that she is ours and that she's so special that nobody would even understand her. But one of the reasons I'm doing both the digital um, series as well as coming to you live every Friday for the entire month of Margari is to give you some interesting insights and perhaps many of you who may be dancers uh, joining me and watching the digital series, you may be interested in just getting to know about her more. So I'm going to break some of the seriousness because you know we think dance, classical dance, ritual, temple, old ancient poetry somehow has to be extremely somber and serious and uh, the dancers are told it's Jivatma, Paramatma, soul and the infinite. But I'll tell you what I received just a few days ago and it's going to make me make you smile. This format doesn't allow for the actual viewing but see what I got, right? You can read it, it's a flip but it's an Andar coloring book. Just to tell you, it's newly published and uh, how her story is so popular through ages. I'm going to show you something else that's really cute. It's an Andal mask. It's a face mask, right? It's really cute and it, it comes with the book. So even from young girls to somebody much older, we've all, in a sense, grown up at least knowing her story, if not fully, uh, Partially even. So I'm going to just recap very quickly. It says sometime in the mid 9th century. Now you've got to think of what the 9th century actually means to us. How early that was. For all of you who are thinking of Mirabai, who's a 16th century, or Janabai, Sakubai, 14th century, um, Lal Ded, who came much later, Akka Mahadevi, the, the Vachana uh, uh, poets of Karnataka, the other people in um, Maharashtra, you must think of what 9th century really meant. I mean, it really was so early. And the idea that here was a story, because we just have sketches, right? We just have a silhouette. We're told um, a little baby girl was found, a foundling. Uh, she was left. We don't know her parents, her birth parents, but she was left in the little grove, the Tulasi grove, next to the Vishnu temple in the town of Sri Viliputur, which is uh, 75 kilometers south of, south of Madurai. Now, Madurai was the capital of the great Pandya kings at that point. The temple shrine in Sri Viliputur was a very humble shrine. By the way, did you know that the official seal of the government of Tamil Nadu is the Andal's temple tower? And it is the Sri Viliputur tower and it's a temple not as famous as, say, the Tanjore Temple. It's not as famous as Madurai Meenakshi Temple. But that was the temple spire that was chosen 
because they said it had fewer sculptures of gods, of the divine and the human beings and the, and the ganas, and it was more cleaner and neater and easier to reproduce as logos and uh, easier to uh, reduce or to amplify, to enlarge. So that's quite an interesting point. But let's get back to the story. That's all we know. She was found as a baby. She was, she was um, discovered by the priest of the temple whose job was uh, to make the garland. So he was a garland maker and he, she was raised. And let me tell you something else. You know, we, um, we're all, we know of all Krishna's antics. Oh, he was a baby, he was a fat little baby, he ran and he stole butter, he did this mischief, he did that mischief. Do you know one of the earliest uh, examples of imagining Krishna as a baby came from Andal's foster father. His name was Peri Arvar, or he was called Vishnu Chittan. Vishnu Chittan means the one who always has Vishnu in his heart. So Vishnu Chittan wrote songs where he imagined himself to be Yashodama. So Yashodamaya, he was Yashoda, the mother. So he wrote songs about uh, Vishnu. And remember, he was making the garland for Vishnu. But in his imagination, he was female, he was Yashoda, and he uh, wrote songs when, where he imagined Vishnu as baby Krishna. So that is one of the earliest examples of um, writing a, a masculine creator or a poet, writing in the feminine tense, but as in a feminine maternal tense. So it's very interesting and Peri Arvar is dated to late, late 8th century. So you can think about what existed around the world at that time. That was actually called the Dark Ages. In, the, in Europe, historically, if you look at that time between the 6th and the 9th century, it's known as the Dark Ages. But somewhere in, in this part of the world, a light was struck. It's like striking a match. And that's how the Bhakti movement began. It began as a revolt and a resistance to the forms of um, uh, Sanskrit, Pali, and what was spoken in courts about the rigid hierarchy of king and priest. And um, people wanted to sing about God in their language. They wanted Tamil. They wanted to adore their God. They wanted to scold their God. They wanted to love their God. They wanted to embrace the God, and so that was that. The Tamil was the voice of the people, the language of the people. Andal, of course, was raised by her foster father, and uh, he, who was also her teacher. We know now from her poetry that she was brilliant. I mean, brilliant. And I'm going to read some examples for you. But she was impatient as she was growing. She was not. She didn't want the baby Krishna of her father's imagination to be the only way that she could imagine Krishna. Maybe when she was young. She was happy with that. She would imagine maybe rock his cradle and maybe repeat some of the uh, songs that her father was singing. But as she grew older, she wanted Krishna to grow with her. So that's really one of the most beautiful journeys. Today, we are on the third day of Dhanur Mas. You know, in North India, it's called Paush. So uh, just like in Marguerite, which is the same Paush lunar month, if you even look up Google, it'll tell you that during the month of Porsche, you don't do things like, you don't uh, conduct marriages, you don't move house. Now, it's not really considered inauspicious because think about it, many or all of our festivals are linked to the agricultural cycles. And it was only in the mid-January, which is Teimasam, when the new month is born, are the farmers able to harvest their crops and get money with which they could spend? So in a way, it was useful to actually say, we can't celebrate any of these things we can't, because all of them need resources, they need money. So how do we spend it? We will spend it in meditation, reflection and contemplation. Remember in the Christian liturgical calendar, this is also called a time of Advent, which has the same kind of thinking. Uh, kind of a pause. The fact that it's become a hallmark holiday calendar is something else, but I just want to go back and just give you a few things to think about. Also, in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna tells Arjuna, 
of all the months in the year, I will be most present and closest to you in the month of Margari. So also remember that it, uh, we slowly begin Uttarayan, which is the sun's ascent in which uh, the pujas can decrease and uh, we will go out and celebrate Basant Panchami and all those other festivals. But let's get back to Andal. So today is the third day of Tirupave. Now, for those of you who don't know the Tirupave, let me just say 30 songs composed by this young girl. She must have been barely, I don't know, 11, 12, 13 by that time, barely a teenager, maybe just a teenager. And she composed these 30 songs. And what she did very cleverly is um, there is there was a custom in Brindavan, uh, which is mentioned in the, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, is mentioned that young unmarried girls would go early in the morning before dawn and they would go in a group to the Yamuna River and then on the banks they would make a sand image of the Devi called Katyayani. So this was actually a Katyayani puja that existed amongst the Gopikas in the Brindavan Mathura area and because it was uh, dark the sun had not risen and, the, and these young and unmarried girls had to go they said, Krishna, you have to come with us. So Krishna would accompany them. He would do all the plucking of the flowers and accompany them uh, and help them. So it was not actually uh, a, a praying to Krishna. It was a pray, pray to Devi as Katyayani. And then the girls would bathe. And this, this ritual was actually so they would get good husbands and they would have good children and... Uh, and they would have a, a good life, a prosperous life. So Andal's imagination takes that Katyayani vow from Vrindavan, transplants it into her town of Puduvai or Sri Vili, or Viliputur, and then imagines another imaginary town called Ayarpadi. Ayarpadi, which means the, the, the town of the Gopikas or the cowherds. Now, she was brought up in a conservative Brahmin household, but because Krishna belonged to the Gopika and the Kauhad clan, she also imagined that she belonged to that. Can you, so this is the imagination. Look at the Katyayani Puja. Look at, uh, look at her imagination, brings it right down south. And what she does is, it's the same thing. Wake up early, let's go, let's bathe. And let's observe this vow. That means let's eat but once a day. And let us um, not eat luxurious foods. Now for the Kahod clan, what was luxurious food? Everything dairy. So vegans, you can shut your ears. But it was milk. It was ghee. It was, it was curd. These were the three essentials. So she says, we won't have any of that. No ghee, no milk, no curd. And... But we will wake early, we will eat but once a day. But by bathing early and we will not waste our time by putting kajal, plucking flowers, spending too much time making different kinds of braids for our hair. No, we pluck the flowers and we will gather them and offer them to Krishna. So that was the theme of the, of the 30 days. The kind of um, abstinence, a vow that says, we will wake early, we will eat only once a day and we will spend our time in contemplation of good deeds, positive thoughts, helping others and also discovering more about ourselves. Uh, as, as the poems uh, increase, you will see that from 5 to 15, she will start waking up all her friends. She'll say, wake up you lazy person, wake up you sleepy head, Wake up, you mad, uh, mad uh, uh, woman. So she goes to 10 houses and wakes everybody up. She wakes every, everybody up like an army general, goes to the temple, wakes up the temple guard, makes him open the temple, goes in. And it's like walking into Krishna's household, goes and wakes up Yashoda, goes and wakes up Nanda Gopal, goes and wakes up Balrama. Then she finally goes to Krishna's bedroom. And she can't say, Krishna, wake up. She goes to Krishna's wife. And in the Tamil tradition, Shri or Lakshmi is called Napinne. So that's the word that Anda uses. Napinne Nangai. Wake up, Napinne. Look, unless you wake up, the Lord won't wake up. He is so immersed, lying on your beautiful lotus breasts 
and your curly hair he's been playing with all night. So the idea of love, sensuous uh, eroticism begins to creep in. Ninth century, a young girl with this vivid and vibrant imagination. So I'm just going to read for you tomorrow's song and I hope you catch it because it's going to be done for the first time by Kathak Dancer. And in Tamil, it's Ari Marekkanna and uh, it is in uh, the Ragam Varali originally set by Arya Kudi Ramana Jaingar. It goes Ari Marekkanna. But for the Kathak dancer, uh, the, the, the singer has changed it and given it a little more space so Madhu can emote and I hope you can catch it. But I'm going to read for you the translation where she looks at the rain and she says, rain, hold nothing from us. Rain without, without delay. Rain like a shower of arrows released from his bow. Rain so we may bathe in Marguerite. We may bathe in his grace. We may bathe and live in this world. We may bathe and rejoice. Rain come with lightning that is like his flaming disc. Rain, so the thunder will sound like the conch, the Valampuri. So look at the images that she's bringing. I know Bharatanatyam dancers will be, will be saying, wow, nice. So these are the kinds of ways in which she creates the imagery of the season. She talks of uh, uh, Krishna as Vishnu first being this giant protector, but also the baby that floats on the leaf. But today I wanted to tell you about some of our more unusual and more daring poems. You will uh, see every morning at six o'clock on our platforms, you'll be able to enjoy one, uh, one of her poems that will be danced every day across many styles, seven different classical styles. But she has a second book of poems and that book of poems is called Natya Tirumuri, which let me tell you, I was not allowed to read. Not just me, lots of people of my generation, uh, Tamil, uh, young Tamil girls, we were not allowed to read. In fact, we were not even told about it. We said, we were told at 4.30 or 5 o'clock, wake up, you dolt dummy head, see what Andal did. By the time she was 12, she wrote the Tirupave. What have you done? You're good for nothing. So Andal was always thrown up to me as some paragon of virtue. It was only later that I got to know that she had a lot of songs that had where she entered the heart of bhakti and her desire was dark and she was, she was also very vulnerable and tender and bruised. I'm going to read to you the first. She throws a challenge to Kamadeva. Okay, the month of Margari is finished and she says, look Kamadeva, listen to my call. Look, I've washed the earth fresh. I have drawn auspicious symbols of the fish and flowers. I've drawn sacred mandalas. I have decorated the streets with fine sand, adorned only for the sole purpose that you will be pleased and you will listen to me. So shoot your arrow into Krishna's heart. Make him notice me. Make him look at me. Look, my body is growing. My breasts are growing. And here she says, I repeat to you, Kamadeva, my magnificent breasts will be touched by no mortal person. No human ever will touch my body because that will be like a fox sniffing at a special sacrifice. That's the kind of imagery she uses. It's very bold. And she says, Kamadeva, she challenges again in the same set of poems. If you don't listen to me, you know what I'll do? I won't wash my hair. I won't brush my teeth. I won't take care of myself. I will lose my beauty and you know, you know who will be to blame? You will be to blame. So she's already, she has uh, established a note of defiance, complete defiance because she says, she believes, she believes that she is the only one for Krishna. She is the only one. Now remember that in the poems and it was, the idea of Krishna, there were no Krishna temples at the time. There were Vishnu temples. And the great temple at the time was Sri Rangam, where Ranganatha is lying in a regal, in a prostrate position. Now, 
but her imagination had already become krishna was like her companion krishna was more accessible to her so that was the way she wanted to love him not as a, an awe inspiring lord who had you know covered the three worlds but as this person who stole the butter stole the clothes she krishna was human for her from that say that um she has a beautiful um uh, you know for all of us i'll tell you um i was married to andal songs it's called the wedding dream we know that uh, in real life she didn't have that kind of lush and opulent wedding but she said i dreamt a dream my friends where a thousand elephants came toward me i dreamt a dream my friend where narayana nambi because nambi is a name for uh, vishnu in a certain in that part of south india nambi means somebody who you can believe in where nambi narayana came on the elephant regal swaying where devi that is parvati herself came because she is his sister and she came offered me the wedding sari and she tied it so can i tell you a custom and i know that there are many young dancers today and i know my generation many or many dancers actually uh, who got uh, who got married from the uh, vaishnav community would wear the andal side konde they really would wear it on the muhurta day and they would be married with the mangal sutra because the idea was the ideal couple andal and ranganatha the bride was andal and she would be married to her ideal husband who was vishnu ranganatha so when we sit on the jula the swing we the the song would be go dei kalyana vai bhogane andal kalyana vai bhogane now her life had very dark moments she was very sad towards the end but there's one gorgeous set of poems uh, which she addresses to the panchajanya the shankar that is held in krishna's hand and she says you know panchajanya this is a interesting story for dancers panchajanya you were born under the ocean where krishna dove down fought with a demon called panchajana killed the demon broke the bones and fashioned the shankar from the bones of a demon that is panchajanya so when the panchajanya blows at the start of the kurukshetra war the sound is so tremendous and terrifying it sends tremors in the enemy camps so to the panchajanya she says she praises and said you who have such a great uh, origin you are shining like chandira mandalam po damodaran kayil you are shining like the stars gleaming in white the contrast of the dark krishna and the white conch please tell me dear conch lalari ven sange how do my krishna's lips taste because you are always touching krishna's lips you are drinking krishna's moisture we mortals have to actually go and take a bath but you are actually bathing in krishna's moisture and look at you sitting like a swan delicately perched like a swan on krishna's shoulders you are so lucky you play with this curly hair tell me o oh conch how do my krishna's lips taste so she ends up praising the conch and at the end she says very sweetly if you don't tell me i'm going to call those 16000 gopis from brindavan they will all come they will surround me and they will they will support me and they will complain to you because you are monopolizing krishna's time you are whispering secrets in his ear you are not allowing him to look at us and you are not telling us any details about krishna it's a very charming decad which is called the pancha janya pat the 10 but later on she comes back to the idea of the conch and she says you know what okay pancha janya uh, uh, krishna loves you you love him it's all very well but look i'm wearing conch bangles and my bangles that i used to love so much and which were so dear to me just like krishna loves the pancha janya they are beginning to slip from my hands now look at the imagery bangles that slip from your hands this is what a lot of bharatanatyam padavarnams have for the pining nayika that i i've lost my appetite 
I can't sleep. I can't, uh, I have no, the food doesn't taste well. I can't, you know, all that. The bangles that slip from your hand already has an imagery. It has an imagery in, in early bhakti poetry. And that's something I want to bring up because we must know the through line. We must know the sutra. We must know what came before. People just didn't create out of nothing. That Tanjay Nalwar just didn't create something out of nothing. So what came before? What were the ideas that came before? Why did male, why did the male bhakti poets write in the feminine tense? Because it was believed that it was through Tayar, it was through Shri, it was through the feminine that you could reach, that you could reach the Lord. He would listen first to his consort and then he would take her advice and then uh, look at his subjects, the people. Which is why, you know, when you go to Tirupati, the actual practice is you go first to Alamelu Mangai. You speak to her and say, you know what, this is what I want from your husband. And then you go up the hill to Tirumala. So now we come to, now she imagines these beautiful poems. She has a beautiful set of messenger poems where she takes nature, all of nature become her messengers. And it is again like a, an arrow full of quivers. She has the rain, the clouds, the coil, the peacock. She has um, the ocean. She has the jasmine creeper. She has so many. She takes nature, just takes nature. And she says, to all of you, one wish. Take my message. To take my message. To the rain, she says, if you want to rain on me, wait. First rain on him. Then come with the dark rain cloud and then rain on me. Because then I will have his grace. To the ocean, she says, please, you have washed over the Lord's feet. Come and wash over mine so I could have a hint of that grace. And like he churned the ocean, he has churned my insides. I'm left with nothing. I'm like a wax outline. I'm ready for his love to pour into me. So the poems increase in desire, in sensuality, in imagery. And I've used some of these, uh, actually a lot of these imagery in um, my, my choreographies. So I, you know, uh, I did share something um, two evenings ago in which I spoke about my journey uh, with Andal. But now I want to come to some of the uh, less happy or less beautiful uh, kind of imagery because we tend to trap Andal in a certain way. We tend to trap her saying we, she has to be this nice sweet girl that we imagine as a goddess holding her parrot and with the side konde and the mala and so this is very, but for me, I want to imagine her as the poet, as this restless, restless, burning, you know, she was burning with ideas, burning with devotion, burning with uh, her love. And she was so, she was so supremely confident that she was the best. She was the best for Krishna. There was nobody else. Uh, I don't know if many of you know about the uh, story of the garland, but that is one of like a very bold uh, moment of what we call transgression. So the Tulasi garland that was uh, made fresh every day for Vishnu by her father, uh, Andal would secretly wear it on her so that, uh, so that, and she would admire herself in the reflection of the well or any gleaming surface. She would say, I think it's really, it's beautiful. Am I not perfect for you, Krishna? Am I not perfect for you? I will be your bride soon. And then she would put it back in the basket. So it was that transgression. And once when her father found her hair, and he scolded her and asked for the Lord's forgiveness to say, I'm sorry, the garland has been polluted by my daughter. I'm going to make a fresh garland. And at that point, I believe when he offers the garland, the garland doesn't stay on the Lord. It falls. And uh, that night, uh, Vishnu Chitarha hears a dream to say, I only want the garland that Goda has worn. Goda was the name that this girl was given. Goda, which means a beautiful garland. Andal means the one who ruled. The, so we, she's known as Andal because she ruled the Lord's heart. She ruled the Lord's heart by singing and uh, devoting her life. So let's get to her darker poems. Uh, let's imagine that she has continued to fast, which she, which she imagines in all, as the poems continue. She says, I'm weak. 
I'm pale, I'm lifeless, my eyes are blurry. So, which means that she is fasting because she tells Kamadeva, I will continue my fast until you listen to me. So later on, let's imagine that she is, a lay, she is uh, either finishing her teens, she must be 20, many of her younger friends must be married by then, her, her father must be at his wit's end, not knowing what to do with her, and she is delirious, she's weakening, maybe her spirit is ebbing, and she says, What she says is, I, I lie here, just besotted, Okay, and I'm just going to read for you a translation because it's, uh, there's lots and lots of things happening, but I just wanted you, yeah. So, I lie here yearning for the familiar sight of Kannan, my dark lord. Don't just stand there mocking me. It's like pouring acid on an open wound. Instead, bring me the golden silk, which is the Pitambara Vastra, that is wrapped around the waist of my great lord. Fan me with it, please, because I'm burning with desire. Then she says, don't speak reckless words. They pierce me like spears. Yadava, the lord of cowherds, he tenderly grazes his cow. He dances on pots. Bring me the tolasi male. Rub it on my chest so I can be close to him. So she continues. She says, my heart burns. My sanity slips. He says, he doesn't even answer. He doesn't even say, don't fear. Wait, I'm coming. He's a thief. She turns on him. He's a liar. He broke his promise to me. He promised that he would come. And he broke his promise. He's a thief, liar. So she, is, she uses such strong words. And she feels that she has the right to use them. And it continues. She says, I weep for him. I worship him. And he doesn't care. He doesn't envelop me. Bring him to me and tie me tightly with him. Bind me with him, she says. Uh, it continues. He says, yes. And then there is, listen to this, there's savagery here. I melt, I fray, but he doesn't care if I live or die. If that thief, that duplicitous, lying Govardhana should even glance at me, I will pluck these useless breasts of mine from their roots and fling it at him. At least then the fire of desire will leave me. So what are breasts in poetry? Remember that this is much, much before Jayadeva and the erotic poetry of Krishna and Radha. Think about the savagery and the kind of violence that she is actually implying. She will have nobody touch her and the breasts that she feels are only deserving to be touched by her Krishna and this Krishna who uncaringly doesn't care for her, then what use are these breasts, she says. I pluck them and throw them. And the imagery, think, in the second century, there was the Tamil epic called Silapa, Silapadikaram. And in that story, the heroine called Kannagi tears her breast to prove her chastity. She says her husband has been um, unlawfully um, killed by the Pandya uh, kingdom for um, wrongfully being accused as a thief. But Kannagi tears her breasts and throws it into the heart of the city of Madurai and that causes the entire city to burn. So the idea of breasts is something very, very potent. You must think of it. Uh, we have the legend of uh, goddess Meenakshi of Madurai who had three breasts and then one is supposed to have uh, disappeared or fallen off. And there is a beautiful uh, sculpture in, uh, in my ancestral temple in Southern Tamil Nadu where Meenakshi is there in a sculpture. She's holding her third breast in her hand as if to say, okay, this has fallen off. What, what, no, so what do you want me to do with it? You know, it's a really bold, beautiful sculpture. But the idea of breasts is also about beauty, femininity, uh, lush sensuality and uh, think about the uh, Shaiva uh, woman devotee called Karekal Ammayar. She was a young beautiful woman but you know what she said? She asked Shiva, I don't want men to look at me. Make me old now. I want to be a hag. I want to be protruding teeth, pendulous breasts. So I want men to leave me alone so I can then 
spend my time worshipping you, Shiva. So there was Karakalamayar who didn't want her youth. She didn't want her beauty. But here was Anda embodied, completely rooted in her physical self. And her imagination for Krishna was also in the physical realm. She wanted to kiss him, stroke him, have her stroke, uh, have him stroke her and uh, embrace him, bind him to her. So that's why the imagery has so much desire and yet there is a sweetness and a directness that comes from the youthfulness of bhakti. You know, there are so many theological discourses about Andar's Tirupade. They say that that is like reading, that is a, the Tamil Veda. They say you, you read the Tirupave, you understand the Tirupave, you don't have to read the Vedas. You don't have to read the Bhagavad Gita. She has brought all the mythological narratives, the imagery, everything is there. She's brought it all. She's brought, the, she goes to the core of Bhakti and she argues and fights and pleads and discusses and scolds and blames as well. Because that was the relationship that the Bhakti poets had with their Ishta Devata. They had, they had the right, they felt, to be that best friend, to be that confidant, to take the liberty to actually uh, love their God and adore their God. So in Andal's voice, and the influence of her Tirupave, can I tell you, has not stayed just with Andal. There was a Shai, uh, Shiva Bhakta poet that she uh, sort of her contemporary, a little later than her, called Manika Vasakar. He's also very, very famous in the Tamil Shiva canon. And he composed 20 poems called the Tiruvam Bhave. The Tirupave and the Tiruvam Bhave. And the Tiruvam Bhave is very similar to the Tirupave. That is, but 20 poems that again urge girls to wake up early and go and bathe. And there the bathing ritual is, uh, is uh, described in more detail. Andal just says come and bathe, but she doesn't describe the bathing ritual. So in towards the end, when we have these dark poems of desire, when she says I'm spent, she also says, yes, I'm mad. Just, just tell everybody I'm mad. I have brought shame on my parents. Uh, everybody is laughing at me. I cannot help it. This is me. I'm mad. So the Natya Tirumari has 14 sets of 10 poems each. And the poems start with a challenge to Kamadeva and it goes through the wedding dream and then it goes to the ode to the conch and then it goes through all the beautiful messenger poems and then it descends into this uh, darkness and desperation and sadness, sadness and loneliness and vulnerability and a really bruised, tortured, torn, really listless young girl. Now, according to legend, uh, they say that she was taken and um, she was merged. She merged into the Lord. Some say it was in Srivali Puttu. Some say it was in Arvat Tirnagri, which is near Tirnalveli. But most people say in Sri Rangam. So she was taken in a palanquin. She was dressed in great bridal finery and she was taken. And, and the wedding dream that she dreams has very much the same. She talks about putting her foot on the stone, which we call the Amikalle. So those, so much of the wedding rituals are still followed today. And uh, Andal is the only mystic bhakti poet to have a temple in her honor. And to that we must owe a lot of people who came immediately after her. Two of the main people being uh, Krishna Devaraya of the Vijayanagara Empire, who fell in love with her story and wrote his own version called Amukta Malyada. And we will have somebody in the next few Fridays talking about this. Beautiful. But let me just tell you how Krishna Devaraya, the king, and he was in the 15th century, 16th century. Uh, he says in the wedding, because Andal had it as a dream, he writes it as like reality. He says, Brahma, Saraswati, Shiva and Parvati were sent by Vishnu to go and ask Vishnu Chittar for Andal's hand, for Godey's hand. So he actually makes the whole, all the heavens and all the gods come and like mark attendance. And here he 
he allows Andal that moment of union and he allows Andal to be taken as an, in an embrace by Vishnu to the banks of, of the river where he makes her his wife. Now, one of the things that you must know is this month of Margari, in all the Vishnu temples, the Tirpave is played early morning, including in Tirupati. And the garland from Srivili Putur, which is Andal's hometown and her temple, goes to Tirumala, to Balaji. It goes to many temples, many Vishnu temples in the area. And because of the beautiful Telugu composition called Amukta Malyada, which means the giver of the worn garland, which is considered one of the gems of Telugu poetry. And because of Krishna Deva Rayas and the Vijayanagara kings were great builders, they were conquerors and builders, he added to the temple complex, the grandeur of the temple complex. And another king was Tirumala Nayak of Madurai, who was equally devoted to Meenakshi and to Andal. So to these two rulers, we owe the great Gopurams, we owe the great corridors and all the frescoes and sculptures and paintings that I hope at some day some of you would be even able to have a virtual tour even if you don't get to visit Andal's temple. But if you go to many South Indian Vishnu temples, you will notice a shrine to Andal. She is given the, a Pratham position because she is really believed to be there. She is with the Lord. So uh, I think it's really important to imagine that this young girl and she was barely maybe 20, 22 uh, when they say her life finished. But the 14 poems tend to end abruptly. Now here's a really important point that all of you must know. All these compositions of the, of the Vaishnav poets were not found in some scroll, they were not found in a manuscript, they were not found in writing, they were revealed, which means they were oral, they were revealed. If that is so, then there may have been gaps. And this is what scholars say, there may have been gaps. So why did we have 30 Tirpave and why only 14 of the next book of poems? Could there have been more? Many people believe, yes, there could have been more. And one of the many charming uh, rituals during these 30 days is how Andal and Vishnu actually cross-dress as one another. So in many Vishnu shrines, you will see Vishnu dressed as Andal. In, many, in the Andal shrine, she is dressed as one avatar of Vishnu almost every day. It's so charming. She wears a, a blue silk jubba with a big silver pot and then she is Krishna. So that she just cross-dresses so easily. No other goddess cross-dresses like this. She, they have given her that supreme position. And if you look at images of Andal, you will see that. You will see a masculine, masculine form. I'm going to show you one image. It's really charming. And I'm taking this from this beautiful book called um, In Andal's In Andal's Garden by uh, by Archana Venkatesh and Crispin uh, and Foot. I'm just going to show you one in which uh, she's brought in a procession, you know, in this. And she is an absolute supreme. She sits like, okay, I hope you can see this. Okay, look at her. One leg up, you know, complete control, right? This is her, this is Andal, this is not, this is not Vishnu. This is not Vishnu, that is Andal. And I'm going to show you one more. Okay, this is just like a panel and uh, I want you to see this, uh, the first two where she's dressed as, the blue one she's dressed as Krishna and the other one she's dressed as Vishnu. So you have so many ways in which they are, she's dressed. And you know, there, um, in, in the coming Fridays, I will tell you about some very charming ceremonies. There is one in Sri Viliputur where the fortune is read in a bed of pearls or in a bed of rice and it's called Mutukuri. And there that is the tradition of the gypsy, the Korati, you know, all the Kuravanjis, people who dance the Kuravanjis will know that there is, so a gypsy comes and she reads the fortune in pearls and then, uh, she, then it's told, yes, only Ranganatha is going to be her, her groom. So there is that ritual. And then there is also a beautiful ritual where for 10 days, She's, uh, um, Andal has brought her hair 
is specially washed and 10 different hairstyles are put and each time there is an ivory comb, a silver mirror and a, a, a glass, there's a glass object which is like to, to remove the knots in your hair, you know, literally. So when the priests are um, really combing her hair, if, well, if you ever have a, a chance, you must listen to the conversation they have. They say, you know, I'll say, Yenna ma, yenna araga, araga dress pan in the pola ma iniki. Like, oh, okay, my dear, shall we dress beautifully and go? Yenna, boyfriend paaka ready ar kengala. Are you ready to meet your boyfriend? So it's that kind of intimacy that even the priests have as they're dressing Andal. They have this conversation with her and she is theirs. She is their sister, their, their uh, aunt, their niece, their mother, whatever. And you know, a few years ago, some of you may have missed it, but there was this huge controversy where uh, the Tamil uh, f film lyricist Vera Muthu uh, made a comment that was not very flattering about Andar. And if you thought that Andar was sort of just a tan bram thing, oh my God, what erupted around Tamil Nadu? She was said, how dare somebody say this about our mother, our sister, our daughter. She's our, she's our Andal. And it, so her, her story has penetrated and percolated deep into the hearts of uh, Tamil country and of Tamil people. And I think that is something that's really, really interesting. And also, uh, she is one, the only, lay, only woman in the Vaishnav canon of 12 male saints. And something else that you must know is that at the time that Andal lived, the kings were all being reconverted back from Buddhism and Jainism back to Shaivism. And uh, they were staunch Shiva, uh, Shiva devotees. So the Shaiva Bhakti poets were allowed to roam freely and sing and uh, sing and adore Shiva. The Vaishnav poets were told to stay in their respective towns. So they say in Tamil, um, Arvargal Nindrapadinal. That means the Arvars, the, the Vaishnav Bhakti poets, stood and sang. Nayan Marhal Narandapadinar. The Shaiva poets walked and sang because they had the freedom to travel the countryside. And I think that um, uh, I can go on and on about uh, Andal and Gode, but I want you to take a little time and do just a little reading because now you have Google as your guru. And there are uh, poets I'd like you to read. I'd like you to read Priya Saruke Chhabria. And uh, her book is called Andal, the Autobiography of a Goddess. Ah, I have it here. Andal, the Autobiography of a Goddess. It's beautifully translated. Archana Venkateshan has called something called the Secret Garland. And then, of course, you have the Giver of the Worn Garland, which is the Telugu translation. But there are many more. And if you don't want... Uh, if you don't want to, uh, you know, have too much reading, just think of her as an amazing and brilliant poet. Just think of her like that. Think of her as having a voice so early that came so many centuries before all the other more famous women poets. And it was not only in, on Indian soil. Remember, in, once it, you, you come to 11th, 12th and 13th century, even in Europe, we had many, many Catholic women who imagined themselves to be the mystic brides of Christ. I'll give you an example of St. Teresa of Avila. She's a 12th century uh, Spanish saint. In her time, she was called mad and she, they called her a heretic because uh, she believed that Christ was her husband, her groom. And later on, she was canonized to be a saint. So if um, whenever you go next to the Vatican or to Rome, there is a statue of St. Teresa near the Vatican, and she sits, it's a marble statue, she, she sits with her head thrown back and abandoned, and over her shoulder is the Archangel Gabriel with an arrow pointed at her heart. God has sent him to pierce her heart, to say, yes, I accept you, I love you. So that I used that image of, from that statue. I used it in my choreography of when Andal has her final moment of being absorbed when she she gives her final breath and she is absorbed into the lord's form so 
I like to, you to think about Andal as not somewhere standing alone, sort of hanging somewhere. She belonged to this amazing bedrock of great uh, ordinary people. They were all not Brahmins. You, you can see from the Bhakti poets, one was a king, a few were Brahmins, some were potters, some were, one was a highway thief, one was a, one was a army soldier who had killed many people and then had the revelation. So just reading their backstories is really quite fascinating. But this month and on Fridays, I'm going to talk just about my favorite. And she's been a companion for me. She's been a lifelong preoccupation for me. And while I do so many other woman-centric themes, when I return to a kind of dance theater, which is slightly more in the traditional mold, it's Andal's voice that pulls me. It's Andal's words that, uh, you know, nudge me back. So um, I want you all to enjoy uh, the next 27 days of Tiripare. If you don't know about it, I want you to try and uh, catch the morning uh, dance videos that come uh, at 6 a.m. and at 7 p.m. in the evenings, uh, dancers across styles will be responding to the, this book of poems, the second book of poems. They're not doing the darkness because it's, uh, it's really quite heartrending, but they're doing the messenger poems, they're doing Kamadeva, they're doing, um, yeah, I think all the, they're also doing the sandcastle poems. So look for them, look for the, uh, enjoy the dances and think, uh, don't think of her as a goddess, think of her as this young girl with so much imagination, desire, ideas, language at her disposal, uh, the brilliance of trying to knit these many worlds and uh, sort of convincing everybody and to be able to take people along. I think she was quite a remarkable, uh, she was a remarkable person in history. And um, uh, she was, uh, she was in, in many ways like a teen icon now because you can see now she's resurging. And because I think the story is so sweet and so heartwarming, you're finding coloring books. I just received an Andal t-shirt as a gift today, just in the mail because people knew that I love uh, her story and her words so much. So don't be surprised if she just, uh, you know, reappears and urges you to uh, reach for a book or next time you go to a temple or you see a sculpture or you see something on your social media, just stop and admire the many ways and the many ways that many artists and dancers and poets and translators have approached her and, uh, you know, uh, translated her world, her words and made them, made them their own. Thank you so much for being uh, such a lovely audience. I mean, I, I don't know how many of you have listened, but I see some of these, uh, some of these lovely comments. So... Uh, thank you and remember to join me again next Friday. We will have uh, a guest speaker and we will find out more. I'll be talking to the person about some rituals and some, some surprising facts. And we'll have something special for the four Fridays of Marguerite. Thank you all. Enjoy your evening or your morning or wherever you all are watching me. Because now at this moment we are global. We are live. We are everywhere. And uh, be safe uh, wherever you are and enjoy your weekend. Namaste.